Here's a question that comes from Recovering Gossip Queen. That's what she calls herself. She asks this question. Is it gossip when a husband and wife talk about other people they know just between themselves? When is it okay for a husband and wife to share everything they think and feel about others? And when does it become gossip? We've been recently convicted that by sharing every opinion we have about others, that it may be gossip. But at the same time, I now feel distance when we don't share what we are thinking about certain situations or people. As if I'm not sharing everything with my husband. As a pastor, do you share everything you think with your wife? about the people in your congregation? If not, do you ever feel like you don't have anyone to share with? Does going to the Lord about people and situations entirely satisfy this human need to share the things that are weighty on our minds? Help. I'm confused about what and when to share. I want to please the Lord first and foremost. I desire to be sanctified in this area. And again, I I was telling you all maybe last week, that it's interesting how a lot of times I'll have three, four, five things happen all at once. And then I'll get a question as well that just pertains to all these other things. And that's really what led me to deal with counsel last week because I had so many different situations that were arising that had to do with counsel. Same thing happened this week with gossip. Um, James actually we had, we had an elders meeting on Sunday and James had said something and he asked all of us do, do you guys think that that was gossip? well it wasn't I, I mean we were talking about a situation that needed to be talked about it seemed like it was very legitimate that that would have been brought up but he was being sensitive to it and Last Thursday, I, um, I, I was talking with a brother and he was saying how an incident or several incidents had taken place and again, this idea of gossip came up. And we've had a couple incidents where somebody has said something or they've had certain intentions and it like went way out down the grapevine and back around the circle to people in both situations and they got their feelings hurt. Two incidents that came up in the elders meeting. And then this question comes in. And um, so this has come up a lot lately and I've thought... Okay, gossip. I mean, what, what are we talking about? First, let's just deal with this word where it shows up a few times. Romans 1.28. Why don't you turn in your Bibles. Check out Romans 1.28. We'll read through the end of the chapter. But I want you to see gossip for what it is first. Romans 1.28 And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. So, hold on to those thoughts. These are a people who are suppressing what can be known about God They've exchanged God, the glory of God, they've exchanged it for every other thing under the sun. They've been given up by God to debased mind. These are things that ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit maliciousness, 
They are gossips. There's our word. Slanderers. Haters of God. Insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. This is, this is stuff in the category that you deserve to die for. They not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. And you have to see, gossip is like right before haters of God. It's, it's shortly after murder. I mean, things that are companions to gossip. You can see the category that it gets put into. What is gossip? I mean, if we, if we just simply look perhaps at a, at, a, at a bunch of the Greek lexicons, just it's this, a whisper, a secret slander, a detractor, a talebearer, used with special reference to secret attacks on a person's character as compared with an open detractor. It's not somebody that just openly is criticizing somebody or slandering somebody or bringing something out, speaking. It's somebody that's secretly doing it. I was just speaking with another pastor today. He said somebody in his church making charges of slander. And he was just pointing out, you know, a lot of times, it's not always the case, but he was just pointing out a lot of times people that cry loudest about slander are the ones that are most guilty of it. He has found in his... Um, and, there, and that's just another occasion where it's come up. It's come up like, what, seven different times over the last week or so. It's, it's, um, I kind of get the idea when those sort of things happen that that's what the Lord wants me to deal with. And then James shoots me an email today that has this question in it. I thought that's, that's certainly the one. Whisper, secret slander, detractor, talebearer. This word shows up in 2 Corinthians. Why don't we look there? 2 Corinthians 12.20 2 Corinthians 12.20 For I fear... I'll let you all get there. For I fear that perhaps when I come I may find you not as I wish. And that you may find me not as you wish. That perhaps there may be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. You see, this is a whole group of things that Paul's saying, I don't want to find in you. If I find that in you when I come visit, I'm going to find you as I don't wish. These are things I do not wish to find in God's people. Remember, they're in the category of all those sins we saw there at the end of Romans chapter 1. He puts it in the camp with conceit, disorder, hostility, slander, anger, quarreling, jealousy. What is it about these specific? I mean, this, this group specifically... I mean, you see a connection between them all. Quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, gossip, conceit, and disorder. You know what we don't have here? Haters of God, disobedient to parents. Why? Because this is a group of sins that are specific to what? I mean, what, what do you see in common about all these? Do you see anything in common about them? In relationships, in the church. That's, that's what these are about. And that's what he was addressing from the very get-go in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. They had disunity in their ranks. And he's saying, I don't want to find this. In other words, gossip goes into the camp of the things that cause strife, quarreling, disunity, division, it's in that camp. It's destructive. It's a kind of sin that is not just in the camp with murder and haters of God, but it's very precisely in the camp of the kind of sins that wreck churches. 
They tear churches apart. In fact, you find in the Proverbs where you have a whisper, friends get divided. That's, that's the kind of thing that happens where you have gossips. Because, for instance, when we were in the elders meeting, two examples came up that different of the elders brought up where somebody had spoken something and it had come all the way around back to them again and they felt hurt. They felt hurt that people were just so freely speaking about their situation and uh, those kind of things are destructive. Those kind of things are hurtful. Those kind of things divide people. Those kind of things cause people to go in polar opposite directions. It drives people apart. It's, it's not healthy to relationships. One other place that I'd like you to look at is 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 13. First Timothy 5, 13. Now, 1 Timothy 5 is speaking about widows. And it seems that there was a group of widows that were added to a list. It seems like a list of women who had lost their husbands, very godly, over 60, who it seems were sent around house to house, probably older women training the younger, acting as midwife. And what you have here is Paul is warning that younger widows, don't put them in that group. Because when you get them bouncing around house to house, they're actually going to be praise of gossip. Because they're not, a lot of them aren't going to be content. At first, they may think they want to be in the group. They've lost their husband. They may feel like, you know, they can serve their life. They can't ever imagine marrying another man. But if they're young, their passions kick in. And, anyways, it's trouble. And that's kind of the context that we find this in. Besides that, they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips, busybodies. In other words, you're, just, you're busy, involved in the lives of other people, saying what they should not. Gossip is saying something you should not. Gossip is sin. Let's put the right tag on it. It's not, oh, that's just that sister's weakness. It's sin. And I say, sister, not that men are incapable of gossip. They're not at all. But because so often it does seem to be a, an especially, right here in 1 Timothy 5, especially dealing with women in this area. Not, again, men are not excluded from this, but it seems to be one of those sins that women especially can be given to. So, what is gossip? Well, it's when we say things that are detracting, it's whispering, it's dividing, it's that kind of speech that is sinful. It is speaking about others, but is it just speaking about others? I mean, how, this, this woman who's asking the question is saying, okay, she and her husband come home, it's a relatively private setting, it's just her and her husband, she's... She wants to be able to fully communicate with her husband. She feels like if she can't do that, somehow um, she's being limited. And she's wondering, you know, can I just say my opinions? Can I give my opinions, my observations, whatever, about different people to my husband? Is this gossip? Well, the thing about gossip is you can't answer that yes or no. It's, it's not a black and white issue. There are numbers of questions that we have to ask when we're, when we're thinking about that. Jesus, uh, let's think about Jesus. I mean, a lot of, when I'm thinking about situations, my mind will a lot of times just run to Him because I ask myself this, 
did Jesus ever talk about other people? Well, He most certainly did. Okay, He says, remember Lot's wife. He's certainly talking about Lot's wife's sin. He's talking about her sin. And He's holding her out there. So, talking about somebody else's sin does not necessarily have to be sin. Well, maybe we say, yeah, but she was dead. She was in hell. She died. You know, she, she got turned into a pillar of salt. She went to hell. So if people are dead and in hell, then we can, we can talk bad about them. Well, Jesus didn't only talk about Lot's wife. He, talk about, he talked specifically about some people that were very much alive at the time He talked about them. The Pharisees. They would be a perfect example. And you know, when he's talking about the Pharisees, you know, his, his disciples would have had pictures in their minds of real people. Men who walked the streets of Jerusalem in that day. These, these were real people. And Jesus did not hesitate to talk about them. He said, right? Just an example, Luke 12, 1. Beware of the leaven of of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now you say, well, he mentioned the Pharisees and that was pretty general. He didn't call them out by name. Well, Paul was pretty good at calling people out by name. We were just in 1 Timothy earlier in the, in the, in the theology class. And Paul clearly calls people out by name. Who are some of the people that he called out by name? How about Alexander the coppersmith? You ever hear about him? He warned Timothy about him. Called him out by name. Can you think of anybody else? Who? Called Demas out by name. Lazy gluttons. He's talking about the Cretans. He was pretty specific. Not by name, but by nationality. Hymenaeus and Alexander. You think that's the same Alexander as Alexander the coppersmith? It certainly could be. Hymenaeus. Philetus. He called these folks out by name. In fact, he, he calls them out. He, he talks about their sin. Yeah. And then somebody could say, yeah, they weren't Christians. He called Peter out. He, not only did he call Peter out, he called Barnabas out. And... Galatians chapter 2, call them out by name. So, and the thing is, Peter wasn't likely in the Galatian churches when, when Paul's saying this. And he likely wasn't there when Paul was writing the letter. Paul's writing about Peter when Peter's somewhere else. Paul's writing about Peter when Peter doesn't even know that Paul's writing about him. And he's talking about his sin and he's, he's hauling it out in the open. So hauling people sin out in the open doesn't, does not necessarily fall into the camp of that which Jesus and apostles thought necessarily always wrong. So, the, so what that leads us to believe is just because I talk about somebody by name, and even when I talk about them specifically by name and I mention their sin or their failures or their falls, does that mean that I'm gossiping? So we need, to, we need to go further. We need to ask more questions. And here's just some that we need to ask. And uh, I don't have these in any specific order. I probably should have tried. You can put them in whatever order you need to. Um, Let's just take, for example, this. Church discipline. Now, if we follow Matthew 18, certainly the first step is not to tell other people about somebody's sin. Right? Not, not the first step. But what happens if your brother doesn't hear you? What do you do? You bring one or two others. So that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, you confirm this thing. But, but here's the thing. What, what is that assuming? Is that assuming that I go to a brother and I just say, 
hey, I need you to come with me, and that's all you say to him, probably you're going to go to these one or two people and you're going to explain the situation. That's, uh, that's probably very appropriate. You're going to talk about the individual and you're going to talk about their sin. Now, you wouldn't have done that in the first step. But because this person has not responded, there is a place to bring it public. Because the thing is, whether you told the, the one or two other guys or not, they're very quickly going to find out. And it says that if they don't hear them, you go tell it to the church. Not just you go bring the church to them, you go tell it to the church. There's, there's an example right there. I'm going to the church. I'm going somewhere. I'm, I'm going to tell somebody that's in turn going to tell the whole church about this individual and about the sin. And obviously in that case, talking about the person is not wrong. It's necessary. It's what Jesus told us to do. Church discipline. Now, if you have a situation like 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where somebody is in notorious sin, I mean, coming and bringing a situation like that before the church immediately, without going through any process, and making their sin known, that's right. That's, that's not only right, if you don't do it like the Corinthians weren't doing it, he called them arrogant. In fact, to not bring sin public in some cases and talk about it is going to be viewed as wrong. It's going to be viewed as as sin on your part and arrogance. But how about this? Um, I was I was just recently telling Tafik that I, I said, brother, now that you're an elder, you're open game. In other words, people are gonna look at you. I expect that when we're evaluating a man for the eldership, there's going to be all manner of conversation going on in the church about whether he's qualified and having discussions back and forth. I expect that when a man preaches a message, the church is very much going to go out in the parking lot afterwards and talk about the message that was preached and not necessarily agree with everything that was said. There's a place to be Berean and to talk and iron sharpening iron and talking about a man's message and talking about a man's qualifications. You know, if you're going to take on yourself a leadership position in the church, you are open to have people looking at your qualifications and discussing with other people and having messages and sermons and Bible studies analyzed evaluated and discussed. If, if the church is going to be faithful with doctrine, if they're going to be faithful to be Berean, if, they're going to, if iron is going to be sharpening iron, you better believe that there should be conversation like this. And listen, if, if we're bringing men up before the church as far as their qualifications, you better believe people are going to be talking about their failures. People are going to be talking about their sin. And rightly so. It is the church's responsibility to be evaluating and so, I came across this by John Piper. He said, he said that in, on the subject of, go, uh, of gossip, he said, I don't mean you can't discuss my sermon, both negatively and positively, without coming to me. Public, and this, is, this is what I really want, liked about what he said, public figures put themselves on the line and understand that everyone will have an opinion about what they say. And he says, that's okay. And anyway, that's the kind of thing that I was telling... Now, he's dealing more with just the sermon content, but I was telling Tafik, just when you're in a leadership position, your decisions are going to be scrutinized. And they need to be. We don't want a church full of people that just blindly are led about. We want people that are evaluating 
We want people that are discerning. We want people that are filtering things through Scripture. We want people analyzing. Good, bad, indifferent. Is this good? Is this best? Is this, is this excellent? Approving things that are excellent? We're looking at a man's life. If we're to imitate that man's life, we're going to be evaluating that all the time. We're going to be evaluating his decisions. We're going to be evaluating his preaching. And I would say the same thing that Piper says. That's okay. We should expect that that's going to happen. And if I'm supposed to have my children in order, you know what? There's a place for the church to be watching my children. And there's a place, I think, for people to have discussion. How about, how about um, just pastoring the flock? You see, this, is, this, is, this was only our second elders meeting, and James was bringing up You know, was it appropriate to say a certain thing? But here's the thing. When we sit in an elders meeting, what's going to happen is we're going to be bringing out all manner of things with regards to... Now, when does it go into gossip though? You know, because the thing is, somebody could look at me as a leader and still gossip about me in a way that's very sinful. We could get together as elders and talk about somebody in the church, and it turns gossip. You see, we could just we could get this mindset, well, you know, when we have an elders meeting, we're free to talk about anybody and say anything because after all, we're elders and We're pastoring the flock, and so we need to know about the condition of the flock. But you know what? That doesn't give us license just to say anything. It's possible to go over that. When when are we going over? Even with regards to, to discipline, even as much as some things need to be known, there's a time when it goes over the top, a time when it becomes that which is wrong. Think about, think about this. I was thinking about counsel we dealt with last week. I mean, look, there are a lot of times when we doubt ourselves. We see somebody... You see, sometimes Matthew 18 isn't so easy because we look at something and, and we feel the tension. Love covers a multitude of sin. And yet, a, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And so I see somebody in the church and I see some sin in their life And we're really undecided. Should I cover it? Or should I say something? And sometimes we want to go to somebody that we want to get counsel from. And we could say, well, you don't actually have to give their name. And that might be true. Any of you that have read old Christian books, um, you'll often see that when the authors speak about certain people, they just say, Mr. P. Have you ever noticed that? Anybody read writings from the 1700s, 1800s and seen that? They they don't give their names. They're very discreet. They write and they don't say who it is. You know, you had Ichabod Spencer. He's written a whole two volumes called pastor sketches does they don't they don't give anybody's name he he talks about the people and the situations but he doesn't give the name but you know there might be sometimes you have to give the name i can tell you if 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 you come to me for counsel and you're looking for my counsel if it's one of the young ladies and they're looking for counsel about the possibility of entering into a courtship with one of the young men in the church well, you, be, you probably really need to give me the name. It's going to be hard for me to make a judgment if I don't get the name. Well, we could be vague. But sometimes you need to give circumstances. You need to give that even further. But even there, it could turn into something that's ugly and not good and not profitable, not helpful. I mean, there's, I, I'm just... Different situations. So... Here's, here's something that we need to think about. And this is, this is a general 
rule from Scripture. And you know it. We looked at it several weeks back when we were talking about actually um, just foul language and the Christian. But Ephesians 4.29 says this, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Now that, you, you see, that's what we want to think about. Corrupting. Corrupting talk over against what kind of talk? The kind that builds up. The kind that ministers grace. It builds up. It ministers grace over against that which tears down. It corrupts. Now, you see, the thing about gossip that we looked at is gossip is destructive. And so we need to weigh things out that way. Is it destructive? Or does it build up? Does it tear down? Does it build up? That's, that would be one of the measuring sticks that I would bring to conversation. We can see. What I tried to do was prove there's various situations in the church where you need to talk about other people. There are times when Jesus spoke about other people. Paul spoke about other people. There are appropriate times to speak about other people and even to speak about their faults, their failures, and their sins. But what we want to look at is this principle. Is it corrupting, corrosive, destructive, tearing down, or does it build up and administer grace? That's what we want to ask ourselves. And that, that's, a good, that, that's one of the first things that I want to lay out before you all to check what you say. Does this profit? Does this build up? Or does this tear down? Because, I mean, here's the thing. I often talk to my wife about situations, individuals, sin, failure. Why? As a pastor, my wife is one of my chief counselors. And my wife has godly perspectives, biblical perspectives, and when I share things with her, she often, often helps me in thinking through things. And most elders will tell you that their wives are unbelievably valuable in that area. And see, if my wife, as a, as a pattern, is helping me to help you, then I would think you would want me to share things with my wife, if it truly helped you. But, if somebody's failure or somebody's sin is such that I know my wife, and if this is something that's going to cause my wife to struggle, I'm not going to tell her. Even though I might value her counsel, if, if sharing this with her is going to cause her to stumble, to think ill of that person, I'm not, I'm not going to tell her. Why? Because it won't build up. It's not going to be helpful. In that case, I will seek other counselors if I need counsel. Why? Because I don't want to damage my wife by what I tell her. And that's the danger that this woman is facing, feeling like she needs to just open up with all of her opinions about people. You know what? Husbands and wives have a lot of influence on each other. And you know, if I walk around and my opinion about somebody is very negative, and I just reflect that negative opinion to my wife all the time, is that going to help my wife think highly of that person? Is that going to... It's not. And so, 
just opening up and sharing every one of my opinions? No, that is not profitable. What we want to think about is what is profitable. Because for one, your opinion of somebody might be wrong. I mean, we really need to be careful that when we speak about other people, that for one, it's truthful. We need to be real careful about our facts. Now listen, gossip isn't just sharing what isn't true. We don't want to justify gossip just because what we said is true. Lots of gossip is true. But there's a lot of gossip because gossip is a sin and because it goes hand in hand with slander. It was right next to slander in the first chapter of Romans. And, and slander is just neighbor. The devil's a slander and the devil's a liar. And so often lies and slander and gossip just go hand in hand. One of the things we need to be careful is we're not just blabbing hearsay all over the place. We want to be very careful that we actually have the facts. And I know, I mean, how many of us know where we've said something and then we come to find out we didn't even have the facts right, even though we might have thought we did. But we want to think, is it, is it going to build up? That's always the case. Is there going to be grace administered? Which really brings us to this. It brings us to motive. Why do I want to talk about that person? Why did Jesus want to talk about Lot's wife? To administer grace. He wanted to protect us. Why did Paul lay Peter out publicly, not just before the Galatians, but before the church through the whole age? I'll tell you why he did. Because Peter did something. Peter was a public figure. And what he did undoubtedly would have gotten around. You know, the more publicity you have when you mess up, the more it gets around. And because Peter's sin, it struck directly at the Gospel. Paul called him out. Why? To protect the Gospel to protect the Galatians. He didn't just make use of his letter to the Galatians, oh, by the way, let me share you the latest from the National Enquirer on Peter. He brought Peter out because he wanted to protect the Galatians from that error that Peter had fallen into. And when Peter fell into that sin, it may be likely that the Galatians already had heard about it. In fact, it may be that the Galatians were justifying some of the things that they were falling into based on the very fact of what Peter had done. And Paul very well knew it and called it out right there and said, I confronted Peter to his face. And so look, when we bring somebody else out like Lot's wife or Demas or Hymenaeus, Alexander, Philetus, when we bring them out because we mean to protect people, beware of Alexander the coppersmith. You see, what we're doing is, is we're actually seeking to preserve, protect, safeguard God's people. And so it's a good thing. You know, you're letting love dictate. It's kind of the, the golden rule. You think about, you know, if, if you just really thought about all the time, if my brother or sister, let's just take it for Christians at this moment, if my brother or sister were to be on the other side of that door over there and they were listening to me talk to my wife or talk to whoever I'm talking to or having a discussion among us elders, if that person was there, would I say it exactly the same way? I want to say it in a way that the person behind that door, if they're listening, if they're in their right mind, would actually recognize is for their own good. And I say in their right mind, because sometimes even when Christians fall into sin, they're not in their right mind. And they don't like the fact that people are talking about it because 
their sin has been discovered and they're uncomfortable and they don't like it and their pride has risen up and they want to go into hiding and they don't want you to stop dealing with them. They just want to be find solitude in their sin. But I tell you, in their right mind, would they appreciate the way you talk about them? And that's, that's a good check. You know, are we speaking the way we, we want people to speak about us? Does, love does cover a multitude of sins. But I'll tell you this, love isn't going to cover somebody's sin when covering that sin is going to damage others. Paul could have covered Peter's sin, but he didn't because by doing so, it very likely could have damaged others. And you know what? When Peter writes his epistles, he talks about his brother Paul. He talk, you don't get any idea that he didn't appreciate him. And you can believe that Peter probably recognized Paul did right right there. Because in his best day, in his right mind, he would recognize Paul did exactly what he should have done. And, and that's how we want to talk. I mean, we would want to talk, if we're, talk, if we're talking among, amongst us as elders, we want to talk in a way that is going to be good. It's going to be beneficial. It's going to safeguard people. You talk about other people when you're wanting to protect somebody. And a lot of times it's the very one you're talking about. Sometimes, like with Alexander the coppersmith, you're trying to protect somebody else. Somebody, sometimes, like talking about Peter, you're trying to protect somebody else. But a lot of times, you're trying to protect that person themselves. If we're in there in an elders meeting and we're talking about that person, we're thinking about their greatest good. We're wanting to rescue them from some difficulty or trial or fall or failure or sin that's in their lives, some weakness. If, if I get talking with a young lady about a man that she's interested in and I start bringing out a laundry list of his sins and failures, I'm wanting to protect her. Not just tear the guy down. Now, I mean, it could turn that. All these things could turn bad if the motive suddenly goes, you know, you just... There's, what, what, there's a proverb that talks about um, it talks about the whisper or gossip and how it's like a sweet morsel and it just goes down. Uh, you know, just talking about other people, having the juicy story, talking about other people at their expense to make yourself look good, tearing others down to lift yourself up, just talking about other people just to rattle off just because you don't have anything profitable to talk about. You just want to seem self-important because you've got the latest juicy news. Um, we don't want to just talk to talk. And you know what happens when it turns gossip? I mean, so often, not only does slander lies they they seem to be in the same but judging you just you start making assessments of other people that are unrighteous and Jesus said judge not that's the kind of judging that he forbids not the kind where we're making spiritual evaluations we have to do that all the time but just where we're hypocrites just we start finding fault we start throwing things out there we start um you know, we, we just want the latest thing. Or some people, some people just really seem to, they, they seem to enjoy when somebody else has failed or they've fallen. Usually they enjoy it because they, they don't really care for the person or they wouldn't enjoy it. What they really care for is themselves. I mean, it's a real common aspect of pride tear down others. Because in so, you know, the nature of pride is to exalt self. And you can either do it by directly boasting and exalting yourself, or you can do it by tearing down others. You see, if you exalt self, you lift yourself above them. And if you tear them down, you lift yourself above them. And so, judging. I want to be very careful about that. We, we just need to examine our motives. 
But I was thinking too, even uh, being a peacemaker may require you to say certain things. You know, I may use an example with people like Paul used Peter or Christ used um, he used Lot's wife as an example to people. I may tell people specifically about somebody because they I see somebody in a situation and I know about somebody else's failure. But in relating the story, I'm really believing it's going to help them. And um, well, I brought up the matter of peacemaker. If, if you're going to seek to be a peacemaker between people, um, there may be times that you have to you need to call certain things out. There may be times that you need to bring certain situations up. You need to delve into certain things. I mean, sometimes when we're trying to resolve problems, we necessarily need to talk. And so, you, you just take a common person. I mean, let, let's think about this. Uh, think about this as well. I would say to somebody that you have to remember this as well. If we love one another, we're going to talk about one another. You know, you can't think you're going to come into a church that is tightly knit and that nobody's going to talk about you. The more people are with you, the more people love you, the more people know your life and get involved in your life, the more they're going to talk about you. This is the more they're going to think about you. And what we think about, we talk about. And, and the thing is, we're talking about it, we're talking about each other all the time. Oh, so and so, how many, how many babies do we have? I mean, there's emails going out, there's Facebook. We've got so many channels today. And and People are having babies, and people get jobs, and people lose jobs, and all sorts of things happen. And you know, is it gossip because I say, I say to somebody, you know, I just heard, oh, oh did you hear? So and so lost their job. Was well, that gossip? I mean, we're talking about each other. We're concerned about each other. We're we're going to be. Oh, did you? I, I mean. There's, there's a place for us when we love each other to want to know what's going on in each other's lives and to be talking with one another about what, what is happening and what we've heard has happened. I mean, there's so many things happening in our church. Somebody says, oh, did you hear that this happened? But again, we, think, we have to think about motive. We have to think about, is this destructive? Does this tear down? Is this in any way belittling? Is this in any way making the person look bad? Am I speaking about them in a way that... Um, and I, I guess why I'm saying that is this. I know somebody just recently got their feelings hurt because something they said to somebody went through the grapevine and came back to them. But I know that that individual has been telling a lot of people about the very thing he was offended got all the way back to him. And it's like, you can't, you can't do that in this church. And I don't believe that had to be gossip. That's, just, that, that's people that care, people that are concerned, people that, that love, people that are going to share those kind of things. And if you go around telling a bunch of people, are you going to assume that... People aren't going to be sharing those things, especially when they're fairly major and traumatic things in your life. Of course people are going to share those kinds of things. And that doesn't necessarily have to be gossip. That's just, now it could be. But if we have those kind of concerns, that's... We, we need to ask ourselves, you know, 
if the person was listening, would I talk just the way I am? Does the golden rule do unto others as I would have them do unto me? Am I talking, to, am I talking about them in a way that I want to be talked about? Or that at least I'm indifferent about whether somebody talked about me that way? Does it build up? Is it corrupting? What's the motive? Remember, truth isn't the issue here. We need to speak truth. But truth can be gossip. Gossip can involve the truth. We ask, is it necessary? We want to make sure that we do have the truth. We want to substantiate things. But um, you want to think about this too. We need to think about when silence is destructive. Because you know, I, I got to thinking, you'll get people who, will they see a problem in somebody's life, but they're so hung up on this gossip thing that they just don't feel like they can go get counsel from somebody and ask about it because they're scared to death they're going to they're gonna go, fall into, into gossip. And while they're hesitating for three weeks, this person is literally... You know, they're about to make shipwreck of the faith. Sometimes our silence is destructive. There are times we want to talk about people. Love demands that we talk about those people. And so we want to think about that. Silence. We want to, th we want to think about this too. You know, especially within the church, one of the things that we want to think about is Jesus, you think about Jesus as an example. Jesus talked to His disciples about the sin of the Pharisees. But you know something else I find Jesus doing as well? He approached the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the lawyers. He approached them directly. When Jesus spoke to His disciples about the error, the sin, the bad doctrine, the bad practice, the hypocrisy of certain people, I'll guarantee this. Jesus never left Himself in a position where His disciples would have been able to go back to the Pharisees and say, Jesus is talking about you, and you know what, he, you know what He's saying about you? This. And they would have said, he did. We never heard any such thing. He's over there talking behind our backs. I guarantee that Jesus dealt with people about those issues. Now, He needed to warn other people about their errors, especially in light of the fact that they didn't repent. But, you know, we want to be real careful when it comes to sin. You don't want to be... That, there's something right there. Talking to other people about somebody's sin. You really need to make sure you're doing it because it is profitable. And because you really do mean to help the person you're talking about. If you don't mean to help them, the only, reason, the only other reason you would talk about somebody's sin is to help somebody else. But we need to think that way. You know, you don't want to talk and bring up people's faults and failures unless you really mean to help them. Or you find it necessary to bring it up to help somebody else. And even there, you can possibly do what the writers of old did. You don't have to use a name. You know, we can talk about all sorts of scenarios and situations without bringing up people's names. And oftentimes that's, that's very helpful. And I don't know, any other, any other thoughts on this subject? Gossip? Any other questions that come to your mind about certain situations? You know, I will, I will at times 
as I'm speaking to other pastors, I will bring up certain situations. Sometimes I will use names and sometimes I won't. And uh, typically when I'm sharing things with other pastors, it's um, sometimes it's counsel. Sometimes it's just you, you bring up these situations and they have had similar situations. Then oftentimes just talking. You see, as a pastor, you're constantly looking at these situations and you're wanting to pastor and protect. You're wanting to deal with the sin in people's lives and often bringing up situations and just talking them over. Sometimes just talking through things uh, with, with either my wife or with other pastors can be very helpful. Just sometimes because of their own experiences, sometimes because of their own counsel, sometimes they'll just mention a verse that helps apply. Sometimes they'll tell stories about situations they went through that in turn you're seeing that there's real similarities and you can you can find out, okay, well, how'd you deal with that situation? And um, but you know, this woman that asked this question, you always have the Lord. I mean, it's almost like she she wants to please the Lord, but she I think she wants a depth of communication with her husband that's not necessary. And the truth is, we can bring everything to the Lord like that. We can take those things, but you know, I don't just I I don't want to just come to my wife and just start sharing my opinions about everybody and just telling my wife how I feel about everybody. Um, and the thing is, we want, to, we, we want to seek to be constructive and upbuilding. Certainly there's a place to speak about people when we're proclaiming another man's goodness, another man's virtues, when we're, um, you know, when we're wanting to speak about somebody, not in a way that we know they're going to hear, not flattery, but where we're, you know, we're thankful for somebody, we appreciate somebody, and we, we can express that to other people. I think that's upbuilding, that's profitable. But we, do, we really do need to, we need to, um, I think this is one of the areas where we need to be one another's keeper in the church. We need to be we need to have our ears open not just to our own speech when it comes to gossip. We need to have our ears open because I'll, t- I'll tell you this. You will kill gossip in the church if you have a church that won't listen to gossip. Not just that won't do it, but that won't listen to it. We need to be able to identify it not only in us, but identify it in others when we see it in others. When other people are talking about others in a way that's destructive and tearing down, in a way that's not good, we need to call them out on it. Don't give them an ear to hear. Draw the line. Tell them to stop. Say, brother, sister, you know, this is, this is probably... We're, we we probably got into an area that isn't good. We probably don't need to go there. We probably don't need to say that. Early in my Christianity, um, of course, I have a big family, so we gossip all the time. But it felt like when I was being converted, God spoke to me, and basically I transformed transformed my gossip when I would talk about family or friends to Jeremiah nine twenty four, which says. Let him who boasts, boast about this, that he knows and understands that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for in these I delight, declares the Lord. So basically, that verse taught me, instead of gossiping about one another, let's just boast about the Lord and that sin nature of that gospel. I mean, that gossip will... And you know, that's, that's extremely helpful. That 
I mean, you know, a lot of people, when they're lost, lost people, I mean, you, you've all seen the old, you know, the old uh, phone systems. And in fact, when I was young, we had a party line. You all know what a party line is? You guys don't even know what corded phones are. How do you know what a... I mean, we had one of the old phones with a cord. You had to stay in one spot. And the people up and down our street were on a party line. So you could pick it up sometimes and the neighbor would be talking. And you know, people used to listen. Well, they'd listen for all the gossip. Lots of lost people, the only reason they, they talk and communicate to each other is to gossip. That's what it's all about. It's all gossip. That's why people get together and they go out and it's just gossip. And, and one of the things in becoming a Christian is putting away... You know, we are still going to talk about one another. We are. But we need to get to where our communication isn't just all about the scoop. And, you know, the latest news. We need, to get, we need to get to the place where we're coming together and we're actually talking about one another. You know, there's a, there is a place to find out how somebody's doing and to help to encourage them. Yeah, I mean, you know, why are we supposed to meet together? What does it say in Hebrews chapter 10? Verse 24 and 25, we come together to stir one another up to love and good works. There's a place now for talking to people about the Lord, talking about the things of Scripture, talking in a way that we used to not talk. All things become new. We have to really, there's a, there's a renewing of the mind as the Christian. Our, our thinking about why we're communicating now, it's not just all, I mean, look, I want to know. I want to know when so and so had a baby. I want to know when so-and-so is in the hospital. I want to know when there's, when there's needs that crop up. I want to know. And you know what? There's, there's lots of people that always like to you know, put this spin on. And, and it's true. You know, um, Somebody will bring up something. Well, we need to pray about it. And all it was was just gossip. But look, in a church where people really do pray for each other, we do want to know what's going on in one another's lives. We do want to know when Letty's struggling. I want to know that. And to tell people that so that they can pray, that's not bogus. That's not, that's not, that's not false. That's not deceptive. That's not just you know, covering over gossip with uh, you know, some little veneer of righteousness it's not that especially when we when we love one another and we're a close-knit church and we really are praying for one another i want to know what's going on i want to know what's going on in my children's life and the church is family too i want to know what's going on in our lives and so that's that's going to happen we're going to be finding out i mean i'm you know as i hear about all the things that are going on i, I don't know how it is with you all I mean, undoubtedly, I've got to be guilty of gossip at times, but I just, I think as I'm hearing things about the church, how I'm processing it, I'm constantly want to hear because I'm processing, you know, is this, is this a problem? Is this, does this speak of spiritual health? Does this speak of financial need? I want to hear, brother and so and so lost his job. Because immediately I'm thinking, I mean, I feel responsibilities for all these things. So I'm, I'm trying to process them. And I got so many things all the time, and I'm hearing them, and I'm trying to bring this together. And I, I guess we just have to, we have to be careful too. And you know, if, if you have a problem with gossip, you need to, you know, I would say, tell those that you communicate with most that confess it to them and say, Keep me accountable. And, and be careful. If there's people that you run into all the time and they're given to gossip, will you cut them off? And if they just keep doing it, they may be people that aren't the best to be communicating with. And it really is something that Paul didn't want to find in the people. It's something that probably really needs to be dealt with. People need to be called out on. Because, because after all, it is destructive if people are saying things about one another 
that it's just it's not good and it's not profitable. The health of the church really depends on this. Our mouths can, can just wreak havoc. They're really reprogramming ourselves where you know I'm gonna get with somebody and it's not gonna be all about you know who's engaged all the time. It's gonna be which that doesn't mean you can't talk about who's engaged, but um, and I know that excites people sometimes and they feel happy for the other people and that's great. But we have to we have to get to the point where we can kind of talk to one another about what the Lord's showing us from Scripture and what God's doing in our lives and and I know I'm I'm not the greatest I, I mean I personally don't feel like I'm the greatest communicator but um, we just we need to be examining motive all the time examining motive. Be careful, brother, in every idle word. The Lord is there. Even though the person we're talking about may not be behind the door, the Lord is in front of the door and behind the door and above the door and below the door and He's listening to our words all the time. We just The mouth, the mouth can just... Uh, the tongue, we can just put forth such words of life and health and... Uh, that's what we need to be striving for.